give you no trouble, I promise you that. I've sent a little insect on ahead to take the fight out of them. <laughs> take special care of those ruby slippers. I want those most of all. Now fly! Fly! <laughs> We should talk a little bit more about Canto and kind of how you guys came together. Uh, you know, I know you're obviously in in um, in L.A., David, Drew. You're in New York. You couldn't be further apart as far as America goes. I guess. Well, I guess one of you could be in Alaska or Hawaii or something. Uh, but you know, how did you guys meet up? And and what is it about like the two of you working together that that produced such a a, a high quality book that was so original and inspiring, like like Canto? It was a lot of fights. So yeah. many <laughs> True, a, lot of, a lot of people walked off. <laughs> <laughs> Flip the table and go. Yeah. Drew, you go, you take it. Um, so I did the original design for Canto uh, seven years ago, somewhere around there. Um, it was done as a challenge to myself to, you know. I, I was doing a horror book at the time. I wanted to see if I could do something maybe a little cuter and was just like, I, I'll base it off of a Tin Man. And I had a really rough idea of what the story was and I shelved it and I stuck it in a drawer and it sat there. And eventually I got to the end of that, to the project that I was working on and uh, David had just randomly emailed me saying, hey, I like your stuff. Um, I want to work together on something. And at the time, I wasn't available to work on anything new. And then I wrapped up the project. Then I came back around to him and sent him what would go on to be Canto. And within about five seconds, I had a response from him going, yes, I'm in. Let's do it. <laughs> and that was basically it. From there, we were kind of off to the races. And he, he took the, the kernel of the idea that I had and expanded it in a way that not only made it more digestible from a mainstream uh, from a mainstream perspective, but also kind of streamlined it in the best way possible and took kind of the best elements that I had and developed them in you know with his own spin on it. And then from there, we've just kind of been going back and forth with each other. Daily, it's been it's been it's actually it's such an incredible process because we message back and forth constantly. We call each other. Um, Drew's working. He sends me panels. I'll call him, run ideas past him, and he'll toss them out and um, throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Draw that? No. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to do that. Terrible um, idea. <laughs> no, so it's it's Drew and. The working relationship that we have is the closest that I've had with any artist on anything that I've worked on. Um, and it's I, honestly, Drew, I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, but that's it's become like the gold standard for me. And now when I'm looking for artists to work with, you know, quality obviously means the most. But if it's an artist that I can communicate with very frequently and it's a collaborative process, that's that's what I want. And so I either have to thank you or um, be mad at you for setting that bar so high. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> By the way, I, I take both. Okay. Uh, it, that's always been my my standard that I've set for myself. I, since I was, I, I like you, Wes, I, from 18 on, I, I've been working in emergency services. I've only ever worked jobs where People only refer to each other as brothers and sisters. That level of working relationship is something I want in comics. I personally, you're by yourself the majority of the time. I can't imagine one not having some measure of social interaction beyond my dog. Uh, and two, she's a cute dog. She is, but she can be a brat. Um, I. I'm investing years of myself into something. I am not interested in doing it with people I don't like or with people I'm not close with, especially because the the last thing I ever want is to be sitting in some legal battle with somebody over this thing that we created together. So for me, that relationship and also the, the open line of communication to make the best product possible 
is, is super important to me. And luckily, I, I've been very fortunate with the writers I've worked with between Philip Seavey and David, who have, you know, it, it's been years now of going back and forth with him. And it's the easiest thing in the world. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll tell you to fuck off later. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, yeah. dude. <laughs> but it, it sounds like, you know, your, your relationship has obviously transcended a business partnership. You know, your, your friends, you know, your creative partners and you, you guys work together and it absolutely comes out on the page. You know, obviously um, I, I don't, you know, I'm in my, my early forties. I think we're all kind of around the same age, you know, growing up. The Wizard of Oz was was still a huge deal when I was a kid. I remember once a year it would come on the on the on the TV. The whole family would stop, and you know everyone would basically watch The Wizard of Oz together in their house. You know, probably with the TV dinner because mom didn't want to miss miss the movie either. And um, while Canto obviously is not, um, there are some derivatives as far as the Tin Man and in the the um, the Clock Heart and things like that. It's not a retelling of of. Um, of the Wizard of Oz itself, but it's certainly inspired by it. And one of the things, you know, obviously I remember as a kid is that movie scared the crap out of me when you have the flying monkeys. And I, you know, um, but it wasn't so terrifying. You know, it wasn't like I was watching The Exorcist when I was five or six years old. It was scary as a five or six year old and it was impactful, but it was it was something that you could handle. And I think you, you guys have translated that well into Canto, where there are some frightening moments, there, there are certainly some scenes that, as you know, when I showed it to my four-year-old, you know, he did get a little tense, mm -hmm. but it was never overwhelming to where it was like, okay, I got to close the book here and, and explain to him that this isn't real. So it, 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 I felt like it in that spirit, it really paid homage to, to the Wizard of Oz very well. Yeah, and um, I've always always, always loved Wizard of Oz. And I don't know if you can see it, but right up there, that green book right there is a 1901 copy of the wonderful Wizard of Oz. And that book, I've told this story so many times, but um, when I was about 12 years old, I went, I grew up in Ohio um, in a small town and I went to my library where I spent all my time and they had a used book sale. And one of the books that they had was like five or $10 and I was 12 and it was a lot of money. And I bought it, and it's this this copy right here, and it's still stamped with my library on the bottom. So I've had it for, um, gosh, almost 30 years now. But, you know, we were inspired by Wizard of Oz. Dante's Inferno helped us bring some of the, a little bit more of the mm -hmm. darkness into it. But also, I grew up on Dark Crystal, Return to Oz, Never Ending Story, Labyrinth. None mm -hmm. of those movies are shiny, happy, my little pony. <laughs> so... To have the that darkness, that that edginess to it that stuck with me as a kid was definitely something that we wanted to channel into it. And there were times when Drew and I pushed back against each other. It's like this is too dark. And he's like, no, this is good. Um, this is the right thing to do. And I think we actually we we found the sweet spot, I think, of not being too scary, but definitely being scary enough that um kids remember it. Oh, I agree. When I when I said earlier that we were looking to like reclaim all ages a little bit, that's part of what that was. Was you know, is trusting kids to know kids want to be scared, but you can't scare the living bejesus out of them. There, there's a fine line to walk, but it's also trusting kids to be smart enough to be able to process what you're giving them. And that, that goes back to our whole thing that we didn't want to talk down to them. Part of what I had laid out with David was what I wanted was something like, you know, in the vein of, for me, it was Ghostbusters, Star Wars, Back to the Future, that 1990 Ninja Turtles. Mm -hmm. Those movies, when I saw them at a young age, are very different from how I process them when I'm 12. They're very different from how I process them when I'm 14, 17, 20, and now 32. That's part of the goal with Canto, is that you're reading this with you know your four-year-old. You both are able to enjoy it even if he doesn't understand necessarily everything going on. He has he has a four-year-old's mind of how he's processing 
what's being presented to him. In six years, in you know, ten years, if he comes back to it, the hope is that he'll come back, enjoy it just as much, but with now whatever life experience and whatever ability to process the book and the story he has now. And then, you know, hopefully in, you know, another 20 years or whatever it is, and he has his own kid and he's able to sit down with them and do this. That's so much of what we wanted to be able to do was that it's all ages. It's meant to bring in all ages. And part of that is being a little bit scary and not being willing to shy away from the darker stuff as, as well as the hopeful stuff. So I do have to ask you about the ending. So I found the choice very interesting. You know, it, you know it's a great tale. Uh, Canto, by the end, is, is experienced a lot, and you're waiting for him to essentially to win. You know, he, he's overcome his fear. He's kind of discovered things about himself. He finally gets back, and you, fi you find out he's too late. Like, was that a difficult you know, creative choice to come up with? I can't imagine you guys are both like, yeah, that's the that's the way to go. I, I you know, there had to be some some butting of heads on that one, right? No, <laughs> no, we were both <laughs> screaming on it. <laughs> we knew we we knew that was how it was going to end because you said it right, Wes. You're reading the story and you are absolutely one hundred percent expecting he's going to get to the top of that Emerald Tower. He's going to face the Shroud of Man and he's going to find their hearts. Mm -hmm. Absolutely expect that. And every step of the story, we try to take whatever we thought the reader would expect and sort of flip it on its head. I like to do that with storytelling generally. If there's something that I think you're going to expect, I want to do a 180 yeah. on it and, and have the reader go, whoa. Now, we still wanted to have the hope there. And so the hope is... He may not have fulfilled, and I think this speaks to kids. This is what I really wanted. We really wanted to convey with this moment in the story. It's kids hope for things and ask for things and wish for things a lot of the time. And it's usually what's, you know, what's what they want right in front of them. And it's teaching them that, you know, you look down the road and you may wish for something and you may not get that, but you may get something better if you just wait for it, if you just do you just do what you need to do. What you achieve may be better than even what you set out to achieve. And yes, he doesn't save her at the end, but he frees us. All, all of his mm -hmm. people have gotten freedom because they've gotten inspiration from him in his courageous quest. So we, de we consciously chose that route way at the beginning. And also, you know, Canto 2 is coming. Yeah. So, you know, it's, the, there's still, there's a lot of story to be told. So this ends in this way, but who knows what might happen down the road. So you mentioned, you know, we, we've mentioned, uh, you know, there is a sequel coming out and you mentioned this is your first, you know, kind of big hit, you know, in the comic book industry. And you, you both worked on other projects, you know, when did IDW finally come back to you guys and, and say, you know what, you know, the, the story is excellent. You know, the, the, the reception is really good which isn't the whole thing, but the sales are there as well. When did they actually come back and say, hey, guys, we, we need more of this, and, and you were going to get a, keep, continue telling your story at IDW? I don't think there was an actual... Yeah. There, there was. It was kind of... So we, we were both at San Diego uh, Comic-Con, and we, we issue one had come out, and the reception had been kind of beyond anything that I think us or IDW had expected. Uh, and we, we knew that there was more. We, we, we had plans from the get-go about where we wanted to go, how long we wanted to run for, where we could expand. And we, we went to our editor and we're like, so, you know, what do you think about volume two? And we stood in the corner of the convention center upstairs in a hallway. Right. Uh, <laughs> and we, we pitched him volume two. It took about 10 minutes and he went, okay, sounds good. Great. Let's do it. <laughs> good I, love. I, I totally will speculate, but putting myself in our editors and um, the other folks at IDW, putting myself in their shoes, my guess is the decision was the assumption was made 
maybe not even a conscious decision, but the assumption was made between issues one and two, because traditionally um, issue one comes out and then the sales for issue two is usually about 50% of the sales to issue one. And we went into three printings right away on issue one. So we knew it was successful, but seeing our drop, I think was about 20% as opposed to 50 from one to two. And I think that was the moment where they're like, you know, this, this is, this is going to have some longevity. And then, you know, sales continued to, you know, we got some attrition as we went along for the six issues, but we still stayed strong by the end. And I think the trade sales have been strong. So I think it was, I want to say San Diego Comic-Con is probably the moment when. But you think they already knew they were just waiting to present you the information. I think it was, I think they go into all of these new books and assume that there is going to be, you know, there's hope for a second Mm -hmm. arc and you just have to wait for it to play out. And I think the hope was confirmed almost right away. We have, I will tell you. It's been amazing. It was at least four. It, it, it four arcs for this camp yeah. specific quest. Um, we have the one shot that's coming that was supposed to come out next month and it's being delayed, Canto and the Clockwork Fairies. And then the first issue of Canto 2 is supposed to come out in July, but that's going to be pushed away too. But I can tell you we're working on San Diego Comic-Con was canceled in person, but I'm sure they're going to do some virtual things and we're definitely working on some virtual things um, exclusives and that sort of thing to continue beating that drum until the physical comics can flow again. Yeah. So is there another plan for Canto? Obviously we're, we're getting a sequel, but uh, you, you know, is the, is the idea that this go, you know, transcends comics and maybe becomes, you know, I could see it absolutely being a, a great animated, uh, you know, movie or something like that. Or even, I don't, I don't know about uh, how it would do really what, live action but certainly animated movie or even like even novels about it you know i think that world tra- could transcend comics very easily so let me maybe i should answer this one drew yeah, go, go ahead <laughs> unfortunately i can't talk about any of the <laughs> tv and film stuff um i agree that it could translate very well into a film or a tv show um I love the idea of prose novels. I love the idea of doing a picture book of Canto and his Malarex. Mm -hmm. Um, So we've talked about all those ideas. Things are in the works. We just really can't. It's hard. It's hard to be able to share a lot of that at this moment. Uh, Oh, I understand. But you're not going to keep this only to us, right? You're going to let the whole world see it, right? Because more people need to know about Canto. Because as great as comic books are, it, it, it needs to get out there. We, oh, we are, we're we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, we, we are definitely working on it right now. Like we're both big believers that at the end of the day, what we make is a comic. We want to make the best comic that we possibly can that all, that can only be made as a comic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But we 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 obviously we have we have hopes for the character in the world and that it will expand beyond just what we're doing and that, you know, hopefully we get the chance to do a TV show and somebody else gets to come in and add their spin to it and, you know, grow it out beyond that because we, we, we both love the the little guy and we want other people to enjoy it. Yeah. So you wouldn't mind other people playing in your playground? No, not, not, not at all. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I'm like- Full creative control. You can't touch the story. Well, I will be. I just. I will be attached to whatever adaptation happens, so you will know that it will be authentic. Mm-hmm. Canto tone. With that said, we could take it. There's a thousand stories to be told in Arcana and Canto's world, greater world, and his people, and all the other people that inhabit this place. Um, and I, uh, we can't obviously be in, involved if there's a thousand different stories being told, but readers can rest assured whatever the next few steps happen with Canto, um, we will definitely be ensuring that it is Canto. It's still Canto. So, you know, we're about to, to wrap up the interview. I really appreciate your guys' time. Is there anything else that, uh, that either of you are working on that, that people should be aware of that, that maybe if, if it's coming out in the near future? 
<laughs> just okay. Is all canto. Canto <laughs> runs my life at the moment. Well, good. That's that's what we want to hear. <laughs> so, fortunately or not, I um I have the opportunity to work on a few different things, and believe it or not, the um I have one thing that was with that's with another publisher that has been pushed from the fall to the spring. Um, more age skewed up um, sci-fi adventure. And then I'm actually working on um, at least two other things in the um, uh, all ages kids book space. So um, those will be, o one's an OGN and one is an actually a picture book. And um, then in, you know, working on um, some TV and film stuff. Nice. So I remember when I reviewed the the first issue of Canto, I, I did you know my research on you guys. There's not a ton of information out there, but one of the things I said was well, these are two uh, creators that you should definitely keep your eye on because it, it's very clear that that Drew is a very talented artist, and, and you had a very uh, great, a uh, tremendous amount of skill writing, especially your prose when you when you were creating the the, the fairy tale within the story uh, was was uh, was very well executed and I'm, I'm very glad you guys i'm excited that you guys came on here i love talking comic books with everybody and i think uh we had a great conversation is there anything else that you guys need to say before we wrap this up support your local comic shop absolutely you absolutely can mail order curbside pickup some of them might be reopening in the states so that's um for good or for ill that's our lifeblood so please 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 help them through this uh, yeah, the industry will be back. What form it's going to look like. I, I know there are retailers and creators right now that everyone's kind of suffering and everyone's in a tough spot and some people can't see the woods for the trees at the moment, but it, I promise you it's going to come back in some way, shape or form. Everyone's just kind of buckled down, work your ass off right now and it, it, it'll get back to normal eventually. You just got to get yeah right now yep catch up, on, catch up on that read pile because you're going to have new comic books in the right. relatively near future you you will you there will be a uh, a tidal wave coming i'm sure <laughs> all right fellas i really appreciate the time thank, thank you for having us on